Welcome, and thank you for your interest in the exhibition, The Woman in White, Joanna Heffernan and James McNeil Whistler. The show has been guest curated by Margaret F. McDonald, the preeminent Whistler scholar from the University of Glasgow, in collaboration with Anne Dumas at the Royal Academy of Arts in London, and myself, Charles Brock, Associate Curator of American and British Paintings here at the National Gallery of Art. The subject of The Woman in White, the painting that first gained artist James McNeil Whistler international notoriety, was Joanna Hiffernan. Hiffernan lived and worked alongside Whistler in England and France during the critical early period of his career in the 1860s. As Whistler's primary model, she was essential to the making of many innovative works, including The Woman in White, later titled Symphony in White No. 1, The White Girl. Her compelling presence and sustained commitment led to a remarkable series of paintings, drawings, and prints that directed modern art away from sentimental storytelling and stark realism toward abstraction. From the moment they were first shown, these complex images have raised issues regarding the identity of their model. Bringing together nearly every known depiction of Hiffernan, as well as relevant documents and letters, this exhibition is an invitation to participate in recovering the humanity of Whistler's often neglected collaborator. Who was Joanna Hiffernan? What was the nature of her relationship with Whistler? What was her role in the creative process? Join us in contemplating these and other questions that emerge as we focus on Hiffernan's perspective. Hiffernan immigrated to London with her parents and siblings by 1843. As Irish Catholics, the Hiffernans experienced poverty and prejudice in a class-bound society that privileged English-born Protestants. Within the unjust social and political hierarchies of the day, the Irish were considered an inferior race. As such, Hiffernan would have been subject to racial stereotyping and bias throughout her life. Hiffernan met Whistler at age 21, inaugurating their complex relationship. The young Bohemians quickly became romantic and working partners. Hiffernan served as the artist's chief model for more than 10 years and at times managed his studio and financial affairs, no small task given his constant struggles with money. Whistler gave his power of attorney to Hiffernan and made her his sole heir in his will in 1866, despite his family's criticisms of their relationship. In 1870, Whistler fathered a child with another woman, irrevocably changing his connection with Hiffernan. Reflecting how unconventional their relationship was in the context of Victorian England, Hiffernan, along with her sister Agnes, raised the boy, Charles Hansen. Hansen remained Hiffernan's primary link to Whistler through the 1870s and 1880s, up until her death from bronchitis in 1886. There are numerous records, letters, and works of art that help us frame Hiffernan's life, but they mainly reflect the perspective of Whistler and others in his circle. Little of Hiffernan's personal correspondence remains. No photographs of her have been discovered. Though there is evidence Hiffernan was a visual artist in her own right, nothing by her appears to have survived. As you consider the works of art in the exhibition, keep in mind how different our understanding of Hiffernan's life and work would be if we were able to see and hear more directly from Hiffernan herself. As an Irish immigrant, Joanna Hiffernan was relegated to working class status in London. She met Whistler in 1860 in a neighborhood known for commercial art supply stores. Given the area, she was probably earning money from drawing and painting as well as modeling. Whistler, on the other hand, was a relatively affluent immigrant from the United States who was attracted to working class areas and people for their artistic potential. The Maritime District of Wapping was the setting for Hiffernan and Whistler's first major artistic collaboration. It was not far from Greenwich where the pair had moved in together and where, although not formally wed, they were listed as married in the 1861 census. Whistler painted Wapping over the course of four years making subtle changes to transform a gritty depiction of a sex worker transacting business to a less explicit, more ambivalent encounter. From new conservation images, we know that Hiffernan's pose, demeanor, and dress underwent numerous revisions. Originally, the neckline of her dress was much lower, and the man next to her leaned in close, one hand on her shoulder, the other behind her back. In the final version, Hiffernan presides over the gathering from the center of the composition, the nature of her now more distant relationship to the two men on the right is unclear. The view in Battersea Reach is taken from the house Whistler and Hiffernan shared in Chelsea, looking out over the River Thames. We catch a fleeting glimpse of Hiffernan at the lower right, walking on the docks in her white dress. Hands in pockets, she is the only figure looking out at us. This is one of the few instances where we find Hiffernan moving freely in the world at large. 
In 1861, Hiffernan began to model for the painting that would later be titled Symphony in White Number no. 1, The White Girl. This is the most iconic full-length portrayal of her. Hiffernan and Whistler worked intensively on it as they traveled between studios in London and Paris. When it was first exhibited, the painting disconcerted London audiences, who were confounded by the grand manner depiction of an unknown model. Hiffernan's inscrutable expression and the restrained setting with flowers falling on an aggressive animal rug only added to the mystery. Who was this woman? What was her story? What was she supposed to represent? Critics in the public variously interpreted her as beautiful, ugly, serious, comical, as a bride or as a disembodied ghost. Anticipating its projection by jurors for the prestigious Royal Academy of Arts in the spring of 1861, Hiffernan wrote, the white girl has made a great sensation for and against. Some stupid painters don't understand it at all. The old duffers may refuse it altogether. A commercial gallery in London originally advertised the painting as The Woman in White, a reference to a popular mystery novel by Wilkie Collins. Whistler refuted the association, claiming, my painting simply represents a girl dressed in white standing in front of a white curtain. Years later, he took a different approach, asserting that the painting was an aesthetic experience analogous to music, a symphony in white. The controversy surrounding the reception of the painting can be traced to the restrained yet forceful presence of Hiffernan herself. Audience at the time expected grand full-length paintings to feature well-known figures in society, to personify the seasons or human virtues, or to embody classical myths. Featuring an unidentified red-haired woman of no clear social class, the white girl confounded those expectations. Depicted here in the London home she shared with Whistler, surrounded by vases and a fan from the artist's extensive East Asian collections, Joanna Hiffernan appears reflected in the mirror above a fireplace, regarding a wedding ring on her left hand. In real life, Hiffernan and Whistler were never formally married, despite the ring she models here. In this, the third and last of the symphonies in white, Hiffernan is no longer the sole focus. She shares the studio space with model Emily Jones, who sits to the right. Hiffernan lounges on a white draped couch, her pose complementing the horizontal orientation of the canvas. This was the first work by Whistler to be exhibited with a musical title, prompting him to append the same title to his two earlier paintings of Hiffernan in a white dress. In 1867, Whistler grouped these three paintings together under the shared musical title, Symphony in White. The trio of carefully arranged interiors heralded the then radical mantra, art for art's sake. Instead of depicting worldly realities, Whistler now declared that the works were concerned with purely aesthetic matters. It was groundbreaking for a painting's meaning, what it was about, to focus solely on abstract qualities like line, color, and form. Yet this shift away from storytelling in art toward abstraction tended to downplay and mask Hiffernan's identity. How does this affect our acknowledgement of her presence and role in creating these works? The meaning of this painting, titled Purple and Rose, the Langalizen of the Six Marks, is contested. Does the painting show a European model and costume in a studio? Or is Hiffernan meant to represent an Asian artist painting a porcelain vase? Several reviewers criticized Hiffernan's appearance, seizing on what they saw as the uneasy slippage and uncertainty regarding her ethnic identity. Whistler added purple and rose to the title in 1892 to designate the painting an abstract exercise in color. Joanna Hiffernan modeled for numerous works in which she is holding, contemplating, and wearing works of Asian art. Whistler revered the arts of Japan and China and helped usher in a European vogue for East Asian art and design in the 1860s. He avidly collected ceramics, prints, and textiles and painted the works into scenes of his studio. More than simply copying his sources, Whistler ultimately aspired to incorporate what he saw as the underlying principles of harmonious color and abstract design of Asian art into his own works. However, there is little evidence that Whistler or Hiffernan were ever deeply interested in the original purpose or the specific cultural context of Asian art. Depicting Hiffernan in interior scenes featuring the artist's collections of Asian art raises additional issues. Does Whistler portray Hiffernan as an integral part of a collaborative artistic process and a creative force in her own right? Or does she become a decorative object like the textiles, fans, and ceramics that accompany her? The Artist in His Studio is the last painting by Whistler to feature Hiffernan. It's also the only one in which they appear together. Hiffernan sits on a chaise lounge at the back of the studio, 
identifiable mainly by her signature white dress. Another model, dressed in a kimono and holding a fan, stands between Heffernan and Whistler. X-radiographs indicate there were once two other men in the painting. Whistler seems to be viewing the studio in a mirror as he paints the very canvas we are presumably looking at. Whistler made many etchings and drawings of Johanna Heffernan at rest. She may have self-consciously modeled these seemingly informal poses, but it is also possible that we catch a glimpse of her real life. These intimate works presumably reveal Hiffernan as Whistler would have encountered his partner in their shared studio space. In his Prints of Hiffernan, Whistler reworked her image on the copper plates over time, which created unique states, slightly different versions of the same print. When he considered the print run complete, Whistler sometimes canceled the plates, scratching through or rubbing out his rendering of Hiffernan to prevent further impressions. In this way, Whistler controlled the use of her printed image. The zigzag lines across Hiffernan's head and torso in the open book are an example of print canceling. Whistler sold dozens of canceled plates after going bankrupt in 1878, relinquishing control of the images, which resulted in later impressions like this one. These prints, titled Joe's Bent Head, were an early collaboration between Hiffernan and Whistler. The different versions, known as states, are experiments with various types of paper, inking techniques, and slight changes to the copper printing plate. The composition's interplay between realistic detail and abstraction evokes the state of consciousness between waking and sleeping. The intimate scale of these works on paper, originally intended to be held in the hand, was well suited to capturing the personal psychological dimensions of the pair's relationship. Hiffernan seems lost in her own thoughts, with her body suggested not by graphic lines, but by the blank open spaces of the lower half of the page. Completed at the beginning of their partnership, the vivid print Joe is the only traditional portrait and perhaps the most intimate of all the images of Hiffernan by Whistler. In this close-up, Hiffernan looks directly at the viewer. The energetic marks describing her wavy hair contrast with her carefully delineated nose, lips, and eyes. Hiffernan is presented here as herself, as Joe, not as an anonymous sitter or as a musical abstraction or in some other guise. By comparing Joe with other works in the exhibition, can we discern a difference between the real Hiffernan and a model playing a role? Dry point is a printing technique in which an artist draws directly on a copper plate with a steel needle, producing sharp lines. Held at an angle, the needle raises a burr, tiny fragments of the displaced copper, that captures extra ink, creating a soft effect when printed. To maintain Weary's delicate textures, the plate wore down quickly, Whistler continually reinforced the lines before printing, creating subtly different versions or states of the work. In the dry point print weary, the dense weave of black marks that describe Hiffernan's brilliant hair gives way to the spare open white spaces of her dress below. For the process of making the print, Hiffernan maintained a reclining pose. This may be an indication of her continual health issues that had worsened during the making of Symphony in White No. 1, when artist and model were exposed to the fumes of toxic lead white paint. These two works explore the same theme as Weary, but were made in a different way. Instead of inking copper plates and using a printing press, Whistler applied chalk and charcoal directly to the paper. In Weary, the emphasis is on the white spaces created by areas left untouched. Here, black predominates as Whistler filled the page with an array of crisscrossing lines. In the fall of 1865, Hiffernan and Whistler traveled to Trouville on the coast of Normandy, France, to join the French realist painter Gustave Courbet. Whistler, Courbet, and possibly Hiffernan herself painted seascapes. The prolific Courbet also undertook the last known portrait of Hiffernan, an image he promised never to sell, but which proved so popular he made several copies. Courbet is the only artist besides Whistler known to have painted Hiffernan. In 1877, the year of his death, he wrote to Whistler, do you remember Trouville and Joe, who played the clown to amuse us? In the evening, she sang Irish songs so well because she had the spirit and distinction of art. Joanna Hiffernan was close with her younger sister, Agnes, who was integral to one of the most perplexing parts of Hiffernan and Whistler's story. The Hiffernan sisters took custody of a son whom Whistler fathered with Louisa Fanny Henson in 1870, an affair that Whistler acknowledged as an infidelity to Joe. As Hiffernan raised Charles James Whistler Hansen at Agnes's home in Chelsea, West London, Whistler began a relationship with a new model and partner, Maud Franklin, seen in this print. In 1880, Whistler wrote to his son while traveling with Franklin in Venice. 
I am so glad, my dear boy, to know that you are so obedient and attentive to your kind Auntie Jo. Tell her with my love that she must expect a letter from me at once. While Whistler's voluminous correspondence has been preserved, there are no extant letters by Hiffernan that can shed light on her version of these events. Whistler's legal commitment to Hiffernan is evident in the document granting her power of attorney and in his will designating Hiffernan as his sole heir. Given the uncertain state of the artist's finances, this authority could have been more burdensome than helpful. They signed the paperwork on January 31, 1866, shortly before Whistler sailed for Valparaiso, Chile, part of an improbable, unsuccessful scheme to make money helping arm the Chileans in their conflict with Spain. In addition to images of Hiffernan, the exhibition also includes a small group of paintings made during the Victorian era by models and artists who either influenced or were themselves directly inspired by Hiffernan and Whistler's most significant and controversial collaboration, Symphony in White Number no. One, The White Girl. Rendering the subtle tonalities and textures of white fabrics, the works convey aspects of Victorian culture in different ways. The American painter Albert Herder's 1892 portrait of his childhood friend, Portrait of Bessie, Miss Elizabeth Newton, includes all the key elements found in Symphony in White No. 1, The White Girl, the white dress, the flower, and the animal skin rug. Whistler sold The White Girl to his half-brother George William Whistler in 1866, but it was not until 1875 that Whistler finally relinquished the work to his nephew in Baltimore. The painting was then exhibited widely in the United States and emulated by Herder and many other American artists. The Virgin Mary clothed in white in Dante Gabriel Rossetti's The Annunciation highlights the color's traditional Christian meaning as a religious symbol of physical and spiritual purity. Rossetti was Whistler's friend, neighbor, and mentor. He imagined the Christian Annunciation when the angel Gabriel announces to the Virgin Mary that she will give birth to Jesus, the Son of God, in an unconventional way. Mary is in bed, as if disturbed from sleep instead of at prayer. Both the artist's sister, Christina, and brother, William, served as models for the work. A Somnambulist by John Everett Millay evokes popular Victorian imagery of ghosts as spectral white apparitions and speaks to the era's fascination with spiritualism and liminal states like sleepwalking. A Somnambulist, or sleepwalker, pauses on the edge of a cliff in a nightgown, empty candlestick in hand. The dark setting adds tension, it is unclear she'll awaken in time. Belay was Whistler's friend and a strong supporter of his work. He expressed his admiration for Symphony in White No. 1, The White Girl, to Joanna Hiffernan. Both his and Whistler's painting suggest an air of mystery, but Millay provides his viewers with more narrative clues. Somnambulism and spiritualism fascinated many Victorians, including Millay, Rossetti, Whistler, and Hiffernan, who was something of a gifted medium herself. John Singer Sargent's Fume d'Ambre is one of the 19th century's most remarkable examples of monochromatic painting in the exhibition. The woman's costume is a fantasy of North African dress that reflects the distorted view of the Arab world known as Orientalism. Sargent invented both the garment and the setting. He began the work in Tangier, Morocco, and incorporated elements from multiple North African cultures. For him and his American, British, and European viewers, accuracy was less important than presenting an exotic fantasy. Linking color to sound, Symphonie en Blanc by André Carpelles pays homage to the original Symphony in White No. 1. A woman stands in a white room. She stares out at us, clutching her garment, revealing her right breast. A vase, a shaded mirror, and her dark hair provide contrast. Like Whistler's portrayal of Joanna Hiffernan, the painting does not have a clear narrative. Painted a decade before Symphony in White No. 1, The White Girl, George Frederick Watts' portrait of Sophia Dalrymple is an important precursor. Like Hiffernan, Dalrymple is dressed informally in a full-length white dress. But whereas Hiffernan's social status was never entirely clear, Dalrymple and her sisters were well-known in upper-class cultural circles. In contrast to the ambivalence and tensions that animate Whistler's portrayal of Hiffernan in The White Girl, Watts's portrait depicts Dalrymple as relaxed and self-assured. Belgian artist Fernand Knopf admired Whistler, and the two exhibited alongside each other in shows organized by the avant-garde symbolist group Les Vins in Brussels in the 1880s. Knopf's portrait is a rare instance in the history of the theme of the woman in white, where the subject is depicted as an artist. The selection of paintings in the exhibition of white women dressed in white by other white artists reflects the lack of representation of people of color in mainstream Victorian visual culture. 
Though these artworks did not challenge Victorian racial conventions, the implications of Symphony in White No. 1, The White Girl, are more complex than they appear at first glance. Many viewers would have perceived Joanna Hiffernan as Irish based on her skin color, facial features, and distinctive reddish-brown hair. Within the biased racial hierarchy of Victorian England, the Irish were considered a separate Celtic race, subordinate to white Anglo-Saxons. Featuring an unknown Irish Catholic working-class immigrant in a prestigious visual context, typically reserved for powerful white elites, a style known as Grand Manor painting, the white girl unsettled the traditions of full-length portraiture. The work's complications and contradictions inspired Whistler and Hiffernan's contemporaries to create their own interpretations of the theme and have continued to fascinate artists up to the present day. Across the 20th and 21st centuries, Archibald Motley, Diego Rivera, Romaine Brooks, Barclay Hendricks, Kehinda Wiley, Vic Muniz, Amy Sherald, and many others have reimagined the power dynamics of portraiture and greatly expanded its range.